In the 1980s and the 1990s, most applications used only a relational database for their data management. But in the early 2000s, software projects started to use an ever-increasing number of data sources. MongoDB popularized the Document Database, which allows storage of objects that do not have a consistent schema. The Hadoop Distributed File System enabled the redundant storage and efficient querying of high volumes of data that are spread out across multiple commodity disks. The Cassandra Database is a hybrid between key-value storage and column-oriented storage. And the benefit of these different data systems is that you can choose a system that gives you the read and write performance that you need. The downside is that each of these databases has different querying semantics. And if you're a developer trying to access data from your application, you often need to know how to access that data from the specific data source. And whether that data needs to be queried with SQL or with a document style query or with a MapReduce job. Spring Data is a project to standardize the programming model for data access within Spring. The vision for the project is to give Spring developers a consistent way to access their data from any database while retaining the performance characteristics of those databases. Spring is a Java framework for writing web applications, but this conversation is useful even for people who are not building these Spring applications. Whatever application you're building, you are probably pulling from multiple data sources. And the question of how to abstract away the complexity of those multiple data sources is also being tackled by projects such as GraphQL and Falcor. John Bloom is a staff engineer who works on the Spring Data Project at Pivotal. He joins the show to discuss how to design a data access layer. We discussed the API between a database and the Spring Data layer and also talked about reactive programming. Reactive programming allows the application layer to respond to changes in the underlying data layer. I interviewed John at Spring One Platform, which is a conference that is organized by Pivotal, who, full disclosure, is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And this week's episodes are all conversations from that conference. If there's a conference that you think I should attend and do some coverage at, please let me know. And whether you like this format or not, I would love to get your feedback. We have some big developments coming for Software Engineering Daily in 2018, and we want to have a closer dialogue with the listeners. Please send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Let me know what's up. Or join our Slack channel. Thanks for listening, and let's get on with this episode. Simplify Continuous Delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines and visualize them end-to-end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, Find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. John Bloom is a staff engineer at Pivotal. John, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. You work on Spring Data, which is a programming model for data access within Spring. And I'd like to ease us into a conversation about Spring Data by starting with just the ways that people access data when using Spring. What are the different ways that people are accessing data in a Spring project? So... There's several different types of data stores that a user might use. A relational store obviously is the most common, but now we have things like Mongo, Redis, Gemfire Geode, Cassandra, Couchbase. I mean, the the stores are sort of uh, very large and growing and probably will continue to be that way. So Spring Data gives you a way to access those repositories in a very common way. 
And it all started from the core Spring framework, you know, with the JDBC template and so on, with JDBC access, with databases, and then having integration with ORM tools like Hibernate and Toplink and so on. And now we're extending that to obviously the NoSQL stores as well. And so Spring Data represents that collection of data access technologies across a diverse set of stores. Let's talk even more broadly. Why do people use different databases for different situations? So, you know, Redis is an in-memory key value store as opposed to MySQL, which is a on-disk database. Why am I choosing different databases in different circumstances? Well, you might have different types of data that you're storing, right? So if I have a document, I might want to store that in Mongo. It makes sense to store it in a structure that's conducive to the type of data that you have. Key value store, very conducive to caching, for instance. If I have caching in my application, either in a service tier or even my data tier between the application and the database, then a key value store makes a lot of sense there. You look at things like graphing databases, like being able to search and make relationships between you know different types of entities. A graph database is really Really applicable there. So I think you want to match the type of data source with the type of use case that you're having. And it largely depends on your queries, right? Cassandra is a good example of that where you design tables around the queries that you're writing, not necessarily around the way you would represent that entity naturally. So it's all catered to how you're accessing that information. Mm-hmm. And an example might be if you are designing a database to have a query across 3 billion users if you want to be doing queries regularly for 3 billion users, that's a much different type of query than, than typically querying for a single user and getting all the fields for that single user. There's just different databases that accommodate different types of queries. Absolutely. I mean, it's also for different types of application purposes, right? If I'm searching for a large number of people across a social graph, that's a lot different than if I'm just pulling up some customer records because somebody called in, right? Maybe someone named John Doe calls in and I want to do a quick search because the person doesn't know their account number or policy number or something like that. Very different ways to manage those those types of data. Also, you know, the data structures are very different between different data stores too. So obviously in a relational world, you have the relational model, you have tables, you have rows and columns and so on. But a lot of, you know, modern data stores are seeing unstructured data or partially semi-structured data, right? And be able to access that data in the most conducive way possible, like searching, for instance, Solar or Lucene. They provide a very rich API to basically search for textual based information, which isn't easy to do in something like a database, right? Because it's not geared towards that specific type of, of, of use case. Yes. Of course, we're talking about the different data use cases at the data layer. When we're talking about manipulating data at the application layer, we pretty much want the data to be in the same format once we bring it into memory and start doing stuff with it. Like when I make a query for a user to get it out of my database, I don't care if it's in MySQL or Cassandra or Hadoop or whatever. Once I pull it into memory, I want to be able to perform operations on that regardless. And so we want some way of unifying all of these different database representations into a common mapping. And this was the the historical reason for having what is called an ORM, the Object Relational Mapper. Can you explain what the role of the Object Relational Mapper is? Well, its primary responsibility is to take your entity or your object that you have represented in your application in whichever language and map it to a relational structure. So your tables, your columns in those tables, and across tables. So depending on how denormalized or normalized your data is, you're going to like break that data up. One of the reasons for that might be to you know, reduce duplication and overhead in the database is the amount of information that you're storing. In other cases, you might want to actually denormalize that data so that you can, you know, run more efficient queries. So again, it always it always has to be driven from some use case. What's the purpose of my data, right? So if uh, if it's transaction processing, you're probably going to use a very normalized structure. And if it's analytical processing, you're you're going to denormalize that to get more performance out of your queries. So. Unfortunately, there really isn't a holy grail for doing mapping between different types of data stores. And that's how these NoSQL stores have become quite popular because I'm actually storing the object in memory. I'm not actually, I'm not, I'm not having to perform any mapping, right? I just have to accommodate a few things 
for the underlying data store. If it's a key value store, I obviously have to have a key that maps to my object, but I don't have to transform that object in any way if I don't want to. I store it in memory. And it makes it easier to do other things such as serialization, right? Like if I need to persist that information, I can serialize that object to disk. I don't have to like um, come up with some intermediate format to, to, to persist this information. I can just serialize the bytes and re deserialize those bytes when I read that information back in. So it reduces the amount of overhead, I guess, in maintaining a data model as well as, you know, the mapping infrastructure that always persists your data and retrieve it. So I think of the ORM and you can, you're much more experienced in this than I am. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think of the ORM as sitting between the developer and the querying layer so that the developer can make calls to the data in the native language that they're coding in. So if I'm a Java developer, I should be able to code against that native language. I should be able to code against that data in Java. I shouldn't have to write a Mongo query or a MySQL query or a Hadoop query every time I'm asking the database for my data. I should just be able to have a Java query essentially a query, a, a command that gets turned into a query through the translation layer of the ORM. Would you say that's accurate? Pretty accurate. I mean, the the whole idea behind ORM is mapping. So it's, its primary responsibility isn't to deal with querying. In fact, it's probably not really ideal to do queries because you can't do complex queries. There are query APIs that Hibernate provides to be able to do more complex queries. But at the end of the day, it's probably easier just to do straight up JDBC if you have really complex queries, inner outer joins, that sort of thing. So not many people that I know of, or at least in applications that I've developed in the past, have I used a ORM tool to really manage my queries. It is a great tool for mapping to my relational database. I'll probably use some other means to actually query that information. Now, if we compare that with something like Spring Data, the nice thing about Spring Data is in addition to providing the CRUD operations, our create, update, delete, we also provide querying, and we do it in a natural way, which is an object-oriented way. So we have a lot of conventions where you can specify a method on your interface. So first of all, I should back up and say that we provide mapping or we provide data access through an interface that basically each store provider implements for the user. So out of the box, all you have to do is extend an interface and you get basic CRUD and querying operations like find by an ID or something like that. And we also give the user the option to actually create additional methods. And if you follow certain conventions, when you create these methods, it'll generate the query syntax for you. Now, obviously it's really difficult to create complex queries just following a naming convention, especially one that's conducive across a wide number of data stores. So each store provides specific hooks where you can customize the querying engine a little bit to do things like joins or maybe perhaps invoke a function even to manipulate that data in some way. So each store is a little bit different in that regard, but they all start from that common repository abstraction. And the idea behind that is I can invoke a query just like I would any object method. It just looks like a method. I have an instance of a customer repository. I have customer repository dot find by name or something like that. And I don't have to write the query for that. The inner underlying framework and infrastructure is smart enough to figure out how to create the appropriate query for that data store. So what are the goals of the Spring Data Project? Well, the primary goal is to provide a common programming model for all the different types of data stores that we actually integrate with. So things like Mongo, Redis, Gemfire, Geode, Cassandra, Couchbase, anyone that has a query engine that can support the repository infrastructure, we want to give our users a very common look and feel to data access, regardless of the data store. And in many ways, these repositories are actually, I guess you could say transferable across the different data stores. We don't really generally recommend that because, you know, each data store is a little bit different in terms of how it indexes data. Some of the query semantics like inner joins or outer joins and, and so on aren't necessarily transferable across all data stores. But generally the repository abstraction is very generic and looks very consistent across all the data stores. Okay. What is the repository abstraction? So the repository is an interface. It's essentially what we used to call the data access object. So it provides, again, it just provides basic CRUD operations. You create, read, update, delete. 
as well as some basic queries or some simple queries. Like I can find a, an object by an ID or something like that. I can find one, I can find all real simple queries. Anything that's pretty common across the majority of the data stores that we support, relational or non-relational or no SQL. But in addition to that, it's an extensible mechanism. So it's just an interface. It's just a specification of what I want my data access to be. And each provider provides a default implementation out of the box that's extensible so users can write their own queries. And if they have really advanced use cases, they can specify annotations and say, you know what, I just want to write this query myself. And of course, Spring Data will delegate to that. So the repository abstraction is a way to basically provide an interface to your data store. So let me see if I understand this correctly. I could build an application where I have a query to my Spring Data repository, and the repository implementation is sitting over a MySQL database, and then I could port that same query to a repository that hits a Cassandra database, and the exact same query would run despite the fact that these are totally different databases. A very similar query would run, but again, you have to kind of be careful there because the way you index in Cassandra is very different than the way you would index in a database. You have to have the notion of, of a secondary index if you include a particular column of your table in a predicate, for instance. Otherwise, Cassandra will uh, most of the time fail without that index. And there's also other things that distinguish Cassandra from a relational database, right? where the degree of normalization in Cassandra is pretty denormalized, like I'm creating a table specifically for this query. So in simple use cases, I would say, yes, you could probably reuse a repository. When you start getting a little bit deeper and your queries become a little bit more specific, geared towards your business use case, where performance is a concern, then you're looking at maybe slightly different queries. But the abstraction is fundamentally the same. I still have an object that I'm invoking, and it invokes a meth- it invokes a query under the hood. It generates different syntax, of course, because a database has SQL and Cassandra has say C- well, it has CQL, right? So yeah. different query language, but effectively the same effect. If you are building a product for software engineers or you are hiring software engineers, Software Engineering Daily is accepting sponsorships for 2018. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com if you're interested. With 23,000 people listening Monday through Friday and the content being fairly selective for a technical listener, Software Engineering Daily is a great way to reach top engineers. And I know that the listeners of Software Engineering Daily are great engineers because I talk to them all the time. I hear from CTOs, CEOs, directors of engineering who listen to the show regularly. I also hear about many newer, hungry software engineers who are looking to level up quickly and prove themselves. And to find out more about sponsoring the show, you can send me an email or tell your marketing director to send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And if you're a listener to the show, thank you so much for supporting it through your audience ship. That is quite enough, but if you're interested in taking your support of the show to the next level, then look at sponsoring the show through your company. So send me an email at jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Thank you. So let's explore what this repository object is doing for us. So if I'm accessing a file in hbase for example hbase is a columnar database that's built on top of the hadoop file system so if i'm pulling a file out of hbase this is probably going to be an enormous file that i'm going to need to manage and spring data might have to do some management to access that file in a way that is comfortable to the application developer what would spring data be doing in that example well that's a I guess maybe a tough example for me to answer okay. since I'm not real familiar with HBase. <laughs> okay. But I could maybe, you know, compare and contrast, let's see, like a SQL database with, say, a NoSQL store sure. like, That's say, Gemfire. Much, much safer, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's probably not all that much different. I don't actually know if we actually even have a Spring Data community module for <laughs> HBase. Okay. Not that I know of. I know we have several community modules for Couchbase and, and Elasticsearch and other ones. HBase doesn't, I don't think, fits in there. So in a SQL world... Let's go back to the example. Like I have a customer and I want to find, look them up by name. Yeah. So I would just specify a method called something like find by name. 
or find by first name and f- last name. And so that's a convention that we would use on the repository query method that users could, you know, refer to the documentation and figure out how to, to write for that particular data store. Under the hood, the JPA provider or it's bringing it to JPA will actually look at that query method, parse it by name, generate the SQL, SQL statement, and then any method parameters that are actually passed to that method or any method parameters that that method declared are actually used as arguments in that query. So we can inspect that method, we can parse that method by name, generate the appropriate SQL, and use whatever runtime arguments that the user passed to that method when they invoked it in that that repository and pass it into the query. How is that different from something like Gemfire? Not much, actually. Gemfire uses a, a query language called OQL, which stands for Object Query Language. So what it generates is something really similar to SQL. In fact, if you look at the, the two, they're almost indistinguishable, other than the fact that I'm not accessing a table in a database. In Gemfire, there's a cache and there's regions. A cache is real similar to a schema in a database, and the regions are real similar to tables. So the syntax is a little bit different, and obviously I can do things like property notation. So I can do like customer dot address dot city in something in, right? So I can do, I can use this dot notation to kind of drill into my object model. So that's the object part of the query language. And the, the repository abstraction is smart enough to know that, okay, if I have a customer and I said address city, it knows that it's a address object on a city and I'm accessing that that city property or field on that address object. So it generates the appropriate query for that data store to access it. And again, it just uses the method arguments that I pass in and I can invoke this query in an object oriented way. So that's what the repository abstraction is doing for you. It's giving you a spring programming model and an object oriented way to basically do CRUD as well as querying operations and sometimes quite complex querying operations depending on the underlying store support. So that's mechanically kind of what what we're looking at. Yeah. So if somebody has a database that they want to write a a compliant I think the term is module, right? If I have a new database, if I have Jeff DB and I want to write a module for it to have it work within Spring Data, what would I have to do? So if we look at like what Spring Data JPA does under the hood, that's a great question because it doesn't necessarily generate directly the SQL for every particular store. Like in JPA's, Spring Data JPA's case, it's going to use the Entity Manager API and the query objects to generate the query. So and it's sort of indirectly generating this query through through JPA, a provider like Hibernate. And in the Gemfire world, it's using Gemfire's objects or query service to generate its OQL query to access that database. So if somebody were to implement a data store for their own, excuse me, a Spring Data repository abstraction for their own data store, then there are certain abstract types that we provide from a framework perspective that they have to implement to basically parse the, you know, the query methods, generate the appropriate queries by accessing the underlying data stores API. So in Cassandra's case, there's a, there's a driver and that driver provides a query API that we use to actually generate the query. A lot of times it isn't just the, the raw, like select star from some table, right? Like there's some API that we can use in JPA's case, it's hibernate or some JPA provider. In Cassandra's case, it would be the Datastax client driver, and there's a query API behind that. In Gemfire's case, there's a query service that you can use to get a query object, construct your OQL that way. Some of them provide you know, a very object-oriented or builder-style API to construct queries in a type kind of safe way. Other ones like Gemfire Geo don't do that, so you're specifying more raw SQL. So the, the, the implementer of the repository abstraction would do whatever is appropriate for their particular data store and implement the abstraction. But we provide the common types that you implement to fit in within the infrastructure so that essentially to the user, it doesn't look any different. To a Spring user, it won't look any different. Okay, so I think if I understand you correctly, there are these collection of, there's these abstractions that whether you are building a Cassandra module or a Mongo module or a MySQL module, you have to implement those different abstractions in order to be compliant with, 
with the Spring Data interface. Is that correct? If you're a framework builder, if you want to extend the Spring Data infrastructure to support a different data store, yes. If you're a developer just using the Spring Data repository infrastructure, you don't have to worry about any of that. All you have to do is p- pick a provider, specify your interface for your application, you're up and running. So I may have misunderstood your earlier question in terms of if I wanted to build a new data store abstraction ah. for Spring Data or if I just wanted to use an existing one. So if I'm using like any supported one, JPA, right. Mongo, Redis, Gemfire, Cassandra, all supported. We already implemented oh, yeah. that within the framework itself. If somebody wants to build one for a new yes. data store that we don't support, like you mentioned HBase earlier, yeah. then there are certain types that we've we built into the framework that you implement that would plug into the repository infrastructure right. and that would give them some momentum in building it out. But they yeah. have to get sp- pretty specific when it comes to their data store when they generate the SQL and however it's appropriate to do that. that so that's actually what I'm curious about is if I am building, if I have this brand new database and somebody made a breakthrough in database technology and it's got some weird stuff going on in there, but presumably it's still a database. It's still, you're still... The, whatever abstractions you've built that plug into Cassandra and MongoDB and all the different modules that people have written in the past for Spring Data, presumably you can fit those abstractions to working with this new database that I've written, that I've created. So what are those abstractions? What are the things that every new database that onboards onto the Spring Data platform has to comply with? I, and this is just, an archite- I'm just curious architectural-wise. Sure. So under the hood... Everything begins with the repository interface. That gives you the type that you're going to be persisting. Like if it's a customer, you'd be specifying a repository for, like, say, a customer type. So the repository abstraction gives the developer, the users of that person's data store abstraction, a starting point. Under there, the implementer is going to look at things like we have a query method abstraction that abstracts out a query method, right, on the repository interface. So if the user of that particular data repository abstraction specified a query method, then in Spring Data Commons, so we have, I'll back up just one second real quick and say that we have a common Spring Data Commons project from which all the other Spring Data projects extend, like Spring Data Gemfire, Spring Data Cassandra, Redis, and Mongo. So they all build on this Spring Data Commons framework that specifies the repository abstraction, that specifies the notion of what a query method is. And the query type gives you things like, is this a paging query? Mm -hmm. For instance, can I page my results? Can I sort my results? So So there's abstractions for all those different capabilities that a query engine might provide, like paging, sorting, providing limits, whether I can enable debugging or tracing in the query and, and that sort of thing, or even perhaps indexing, right? So we provide a hierarchy and a, a type library of all the different things that a query engine, a data access repository or object might contain that a provi- particular provider like HBase or Cassandra would implement based on the features they support, right? So by way of example, Gemfire doesn't support distributed joins or, or outer joins as such because it's a very complex problem to implement. So we wouldn't provide any kind of like cross-region capability to query across multiple different regions, for instance. In Gemfire, it has to be co-located. Actually, that's quite a bad example. Maybe a better example (laughs) might be, let's take paging, right? Not all data stores support paging. Gemfire doesn't support paging, for instance. So there's an extension of the repository interface called CRUD repository. On top of CRUD repository, there's paging and sorting. So for data stores that support paging and sorting of results, Gemfire supports sorting but not paging. So those aspects of the Spring Data repository implementation in Spring Data Gemfire and Geode are left out, right? They're not implemented. And basically, the user will get a nice friendly message to say that paging is not supported. Or they won't be able to they won't necessarily be able to provide a repository abstraction that implements the paging and sorting interface. If they did, if they tried to do that, then basically the module would tell them that paging is not supported. Yeah. Sorting is supported. So that's something that Gemfire supports and there's types for in the spring data commons framework to support sorting, like sort by fields, in sending and descending order. So there's a sort class. There's a direction class to specify which direction you're sorting, either ascending, descending. So there's all these abstractions that represent what different capabilities that a query engine and a particular provider provides. So my step one with implementing Jeff DB that is Spring Data compliant is I extend the repository. So you want to create a implementation of the CRUD repository. If, you're, if your database provides simple create, read, update, delete, 
So the repository abstraction, the repository interface itself is just a marker, but on top of that, there's the CRUD repository, which extends the repository with your CRUD operations. So your first job as a data Joe DB implementer is to provide an implementation for that simple CRUD repository interface. And then beyond that, you're going to start looking at how do I support the user's ability to create queries, maybe by convention over configuration, right? Like I don't want to have to specify whatever query language that your database comes up with. I want to do it through the method, the query method abstraction. So then you start looking at things like how do I parse the method name and how do I represent that internally? And that's where some of the types from Spring Data Commons' framework comes into play, like the query method. We have a thing called the part tree parser that looks at the query method name and can parse it out. So we provide implementations for all those things based on what kind of operators your your query language supports what kind of joins like ands and ors right between your conditions and so on so or what kind of predicates i should say not joins but just depending on the, the syntactic structure yeah of your query language what it supports there's different types you can implement that help you build into the spring data commons or repository infrastructure yeah for your database now based on most of our conversation so far people who are totally new to this topic might be just thinking okay so this is basically like a translation layer of like my Java code into a query that is specific to this underlying database. But you alluded to something there, unless I misheard you, that, that was pretty interesting which when you were when you were talking about geode. So geode, well Apache Geode, we actually did a show on this a while ago, which is it's a, a distributed well, Gemfire is I think the the productized version of it, is that right? Yeah, so Apache Geode is the open source version of Pivotal Gemfire, yes. and Pivotal Gemfire is the commercial version that Pivotal yes. maintains. Yes. And this is a distributed in-memory database. So basically, it's it's like it's you get the speed of an in-memory store, but you get some, I think, some durability because it's replicated. Am I articulating it correctly? Yeah, so you get what's called replication so you get replication across distributed across the cluster and durability you get the persistence aspect of it so in the traditional acid sense you know i can persist my transaction it's not lost it's durable right it doesn't persistent lose. to disk or persistent through by virtue of being replicated persistent to disk so both pivotal gemfire apache geode support persistence and different data management policies so you can enable persistence and it writes to its own disk store disk format it's called an op log and it's an append only log similar to like other types of data stores and of course compaction in there is required but it's a share nothing architecture so there's no single point of failure there there's no master slave type yeah. relationship so what i was gonna say is i thought i heard you allude to something where if you issue a query just a naive query from your application layer to a repository that is a geode or a Gemfire repository, I should say, so it's a distributed in-memory store, you might have things going on at the repository layer where it is managing data across multiple regions. So you might have some distributed querying going on, so more, some more complex multi-region stuff that could potentially happen. Yeah, so by default, repositories don't s support the notion of joins, at least not in the NoSQL space very much as like compared to like say the relational world partially because your data could not be on the node in which you're querying so you can join regions so long as they're co-located so within a single node that you're querying the data must all reside on that node so there's no concept of distributed joins okay. in order to implement something like that you need to use other mechanisms that that geode and gemfire support to do a more distributed nature query, right? Like I'm going to run this query across my nodes that contain the data that I'm interested in. And you take advantage of other features like function execution to be able to do that. So that's similar to like Hadoop's map reduce, right? I can send out my functionality to the data as opposed to bring the data to me and then act on it. So you would use Gemfire's function execution in that case to do a more distributed like join because you have to take the query to where the data lives and you can only join it when that data is co-located on the same node. So you might have two regions, right? Region A, region B. If you're joining those two regions, they have to exist on the node in which that query is being executed, both regions, to join the join that stuff. So there's no real notion of a distributed join. Like I can't join region A with region B if region A is on node one and region B is on node two. And the repository abstraction doesn't support that, does support that either. So you'd have to implement that yourself. Mm -hmm.
are building a cloud native application and you need to pick a cloud service provider. Maybe you're just starting out with a new app, but you have dreams of scaling into the next giant unicorn. Maybe your business has been using on-premise servers and you want to start moving some of your infrastructure to a secure cloud provider that you can trust. Maybe you're already in the cloud, but you want to go multi-cloud for added resilience. IBM Cloud gives you all the tools you need to build cloud-native applications. Use IBM Cloud Container Service to easily manage the deployment of your Docker containers. For serverless applications, use IBM Cloud Functions for low-cost, event-driven scalability. If you like to work with a fully managed platform as a service, IBM Cloud Foundry gives you a cloud operating system to control your distributed application. IBM Cloud is built on top of open source tools, and it integrates with all the third-party services that you need to build, deploy, and manage your application. To start building with AI, IoT, data, and mobile services today, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash IBM and get started with countless tutorials and SDKs. You can start building apps for free and try numerous cloud services with no time restrictions. Try it out at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash IBM. Thanks again to IBM for being a new sponsor. We really appreciate it. So I guess I'd like to, to dive into to Gemfire slash Geode a little bit more and then maybe talk about how the implementation of Spring Data for that specific database was done, because I know you worked on that recently, I think that'll shed more light on how Spring Data works. So just to reiterate, Gemfire is a productized version of this Apache Geode project, which is an in-memory, distributed, replicated, persistent data store. Why do people use Gemfire? What is it useful for? What kinds of transactions? So historically, it's been used in stock market transactions to basically manage trades at a very high volume. So given its scale out nature, you know, linear scale out versus up, I know I'm not adding more disk or CPU, I'm just adding more nodes to my cluster, the commoditized cheap, you know, obviously scale out infrastructure that Facebook and other companies like Google and Amazon popularized. And having that data in memory is very appealing because I reduce the latency and, and there's no disk seek. Depending on how I manage my data across that cluster, I can get high read and, and write throughput. So there's all kinds of appealing ways or appealing reasons to use it. And historically, it's been used in high volume trade transactions because of its performance. So that's where it started. It's, it started at its roots. And now it's sort of kind of making its way towards the cloud now because it's becoming applicable to our cloud native patterns there. But yeah, historically, it's it started as a financial system of record kind of acid compliant database system of record store and geode is so you you said it's it's in memory but you can also have durability so is is all of the data in geode also written to disk it's it's all durable or so you can turn on persistence by default so you can say i want my region to be persistent and it'll write all operations to disk either synchronously or asynchronously you can also just overflow to disk. Maybe you have regions that you don't want to be persistent. It's not necessary to keep that data around. But given the disparity between di memory and disk, obviously disk exceeds the capacity of memory many times order over, but the order of magnitude of speed of memory is obviously a lot faster. So any data that is being operated on inside Gemfire and Geode, of course, is, is in memory. And then any data that's not frequently used or at least recently used gets overflowed to disk but there's always that option to configure either overflow or persistence to write to disk yep okay and so when you were implementing the the spring data repository specifically for geode give me some examples of things that you had to do specifically for that repository that you probably would not have had to do on some you know some other repository implementation Okay. Does that question make sense? Yeah, a little bit, I suppose. There's, I guess, OQL and the capabilities in Gemfire are kind of a subset to, like, say, SQL, for instance. Okay. There's a lot more 
I guess, power in, in SQL in general than there is in OQL. Although the languages are different. Obviously, there's different advantages to and disadvantages to each approach. Obviously, SQL doesn't have the notion of object notation, right? Nesting of, of particular fields or properties, accessing stuff in an object-oriented way. But in terms of the implementation, it was pretty straightforward. So again, we start with the repository abstraction yeah. and we build on what kind of capabilities does Gemfire support? Well, because Gemfire supports persistence, right? Or pers- supports adding data to Gemfire and pulling data out, it made sense to extend the CRUD repository abstraction. So I started there and we implemented the CRUD repository operations to create, to read, to update, delete. So the read operations are like your find by ID, find all, exist, count. OQL language supports the notion of account, select account star by some region or from some region. So it made sense to implement all the kind of basic data access operations that Gemfire supported, as well as the basic queries, and then the, to extend it from there. So what kind of operators does the query language support, for instance, right? Like, so things like I can select something that's in a particular set, or I can join two predicates like with an and or an or, I can do order by clauses. So it's you start adding on to that repository implementation based on the capabilities of the store. But there's a point where you, you reach, you reach the, the peak at which the, the query engine for that store gives you. So in Jim and Geo's case, I mentioned that it doesn't support paging. There's no notion of a cursor. So it's not as easy to page data in Gemfire as it is a relational database when you have the notion of a cursor and fetch sizes and all that stuff, the OQL language doesn't support that. So that part of the repository implementation, I didn't implement. We just put in messages to say that this feature is not available or perhaps it is available and the driver matures and then we go back and we, we build it in. But depending on where the state of the data store is out of the box, it may or may not be something that we have to implement initially. Okay, let's take something totally different. Elasticsearch, which is you know basically a search index, which is technically a database. I I make search when I make a search query on an Elasticsearch cluster, it's that is a database. I believe Spring Data has an Elasticsearch repository, is it, or does it? It does Spring Data Elasticsearch, and it's a community led module, so we don't lead that internally. So there's a, actually a handful of modules that are led by Pivotal and then a handful that are led by the community. Mm-hmm. And we roll them all up into a kind of a single release based on the relationship we'd have with the, the providers of those data stores. Like Hazelcast, for instance, there's a Spring Data Hazelcast, which isn't actually part of our release cycle, mm-hmm. but it exists nonetheless. It's a community module. Other ones like Couchbase or Elasticsearch, which are community-led modules, we do roll into our, our release train releases. Okay. So it just depends. Just uh, maybe you're not the right guy to ask about this, but just to further the point of this design of this repository abstraction, what would be some of the things that a search index might want to implement if it's extending the repository? If you're the person who is creating the repository that is the module that is compliant with the repository and you're making it for Elasticsearch. Yeah, that's a difficult one for me to probably answer <laughs> yeah, since right. I'm not uh, qualified all right, all right. to really talk about Elasticsearch. Right. But I guess I can kind of relate that to something in Gemfire and Geo because we recently added support for textual searches okay. using using Lucene. And that's something that I haven't actually, I guess, completely thought about how it would actually integrate that with the repository abstraction right now. Okay. So it's definitely something that I think would be worthwhile. Like maybe I want to run like a Lucene textual search, right? But I want to invoke that in a repository programming model, an yeah. object programming model, right? I want to say my customer repository dot search for something, you know, or search for like, say a book by title or search with search for all books in a particular category, right? Well, that that's maybe not such a great search example, but you know, you might look for certain text within titles or descriptions and you want to pull those out of your, of your data store. And so that's something that I'm kind of venturing into a new space with on Jim and Geo that I haven't thought about before. Another good example, maybe not search related would be something like continuous query in Gemfire. Okay. So the nature of continuous query is to handle eventing. So I'm interested in some events that happen. This is really maybe common in internet of things, right? I've got these sensors and they're constantly feeding some particular backend data store with all the information that's coming in from that sensor. And maybe I'm interested in, you know, like a temperature gauge or something like that. And when it goes below a certain threshold or goes above a certain threshold, and I want to be notified of that so I can act on it. So Gemfire has a notion of what's called a continuous query, which is basically just using the OQL abstraction or the OQL syntax to write a query that says, whenever data 
is updated or put into my system that matches the predicate of my query, tell me about it. Fires an event. And so I can register the CQ and it continuously runs in the background and I can register a listener with that CQ as well. And I can get notified anytime data changes that matches my predicate of my query. It's actually a really quite slick mechanism compared to the traditional ways in which interest registration is done. I'm usually registering interest in a key or I'm using some crazy regex expression, regular expression to try to express what I'm interested in. And, and it's easy to not be able to capture the right information in that particular carry scenario, you either catch too much or too few. And so with the querying capability, I can say, well, I want to just match on specific criteria. And then I get notified of that event. That's a good example of something I'm thinking about how to integrate with a repository abstraction. So like say, you know, right now Spring's all about the reactive use cases, yeah. right? We're, we're talking about reactor, we're talking about RX Java, the pub sub, you know, subscriber models and the the mono and the flux so the cqs would fit perfectly with what reactor calls a flux which is a publisher of data right like i can get information back and do that in a reactive way when that event becomes available so the cq only gets triggered when an event happens and then the flux is essentially a continuous stream of events so i can wrap those events in a flux and provide reactive support inside the spring data gemfire and that would be an extension to the repository abstraction that spring data gemfire provides today but it's something i would have to implement fortunately for me however there's a bunch of new classes in spring data commons k so we rename all of our release trains after famous computer scientists so k is our latest release of spring data commons or the spring data framework itself overall or alan Alan Kay, after, yeah, our famous computer scientist, Alan Kay. Before that, we had Ingalls, and our next release train is actually going to be Lovelace, after Ada Lovelace. So in Kay, we provided all the reactor support to match what's in Spring Framework 5. And so there's a reactive repository abstraction now that returns things like when I find by an ID, it returns a model of that type. A model meaning I either have zero or one item in that particular stream. And a flux being, I want to find all, or I want to find by people with last name, Doe, or something like that, it returns you a flux in a stream. So that data may not be available at the time that you query in it, and I don't want to block that thread. So it provides this flux. And the nice thing about reactive is you really can't be reactive unless you're reactive across your entire stack from the web front into the data tier. So Spring Data provides that abstraction for reactive data access for the stores that support reactive. Some of the stores support it like Mongo and, and Redis. Other stores like Sandra also have an implementation, but it's built around their async API. And of course, Spring Data Gemfire Geo doesn't have anything yet, but I think a natural pairing there would be to pair that with the CQ functionality because it's asynchronous in nature. And we could wrap it with types that people are familiar with, either pub sub, you know, from RX Java, or you know, you have your your flux in your model from Reactor. So that would be something that where I would extend Spring Data's repository infrastructure to support that. And like I said, fortunately, I can build off some stuff that we've already put in Spring Data K to make that a little bit easier for me to do. I want to unpack some of the things you just said. So first, this model of reactive programming. I think of this correct me if I'm wrong, in the sense that I've got some service that is interfacing with my database. There is another service somewhere that also interfaces with the same database. I am the service owner of service A. Some other person is the service owner of service B. They're just communicating with the database. I want to be able to know when service B has made a change to the database. I want to be able to react to the change that service B has made to the database. So the, what you said there is in order to be reactive, you need to be reactive throughout the entire stack. And the reason for that is the database that service B writes to needs to push a notification to service A. Is that correct? So. If you think of like messaging architecture where you have publishers and subscribers and queues, right? If I'm a publisher, I don't have to care who's subscribed. I just have to publish to a queue and then anybody that's interested can subscribe to that. And Gemfire's CQ functionality kind of is the same mechanism there, right? Like I can, I can register a CQ for specific events that happen within a region. So you can actually use Gemfire as sort of a, a messaging system as well. I can write events or data into a region 
And when it matches my criteria, as I mentioned before, based on a query predicate, I will get notified about that. And the whole idea behind reactive is, is I don't want to be blocked waiting for something to happen, right? Like I, I want to be notified when something happens. So it's an inventing type architecture that doesn't tie up resources for things that quite frankly, I don't know when's going to happen. If the temperature changes one or two degrees, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I'm definitely interested when it does happen. So I don't have to have a thread that constantly pulls and, and listens for that. It can get notified asynchronously when that event happens. So that's kind of the whole idea behind the reactive architecture is I don't have this blocking infrastructure that ties up my my application resources to specifically look for things. I just get towed when those things happen. And so it's a natural extension for us to build that that infrastructure from into Spring Data because it extends all the way back to the front end when I'm looking at, you know, writing, I'm interacting with users, right? They come and go or they submit requests and depending on what type of information or look for, that information may or may not be readily available. So we need to basically react to things in a very reactive way. And that's how Reactor and the Spring Data reactive extensions are built into that. Hmm. So if I want to at my application level, make a continuous query to a repository, what is the right interface between me, the application developer, and the repository that is capable of doing continuous reactive queries? So essentially, I just implement a listener, right? Like I just subscribe. I just want to be notified when this happens. I'm just going to subscribe with the publisher or the source of that data and get notified when when an event happens and a very specific event right i can be specific about which events i'm interested in so that's where that query comes in so effectively we'll only have to have a common a queue if you will where we we collaborate through right the publisher writes things to this queue and i receive things from this queue based on my interest and so that's it's a really simple mechanism. Essentially, you know, you have a publisher that's publishing and writing, and you have a listener that's reading and pulling the information when these these events happens. Or technically, it's getting pushed these events when these events happen. It doesn't have to actually pull for anything. So it's a really simple interface. It's not much different than your observer observable pattern that you know we've we've known forever. It's just manifested itself in different ways now that we've got new frameworks and tools for expressing that. Whether it's our old message pub sub or it's our new reactive type world sure so if i'm the application developer though so like let's say i'm developing just i'm random developer building an application and i'm gonna instantiate a spring a repository that is backed by let's say gemfire the, the, the gemfire database and I want to subscribe to changes in that underlying Gemfire database. So you're saying that the programming primitive I'm using is the subscribe primitive? So it's actually, well, this is where I've been thinking about extending Spring Data's Gemfire's repository infrastructure to basically have it just be another query method on a repository interface. Continuous just, query. A continuous query in this case, right? Not a regular OQL query um, where I just want to go out and fetch that data and I block and wait until that data is available to me. So in this particular case, I want to say I'm going to invoke a, say, a repository method that returns excuse me, that registers itself as a CQ and that gets called in an eventing mechanism that gets notified of the events when that CQ uh, I'm sorry, gets CQ, triggered. CQ, CQ, CQ. I'm sorry, continuous queries. Continuous queries. Yeah, so I, whenever I think of, whenever I refer to CQs, I just mean continuous query there where I write a query that's continuously run by Gemfire in the background. Yeah. So every repository is always tied to some data source, right? Like it's it's a particular table or in Gemfire's case, it's a region. And on that region, I can query it using just our normal semantics of like OQL, or I can register interests in particular events, and I can use Gemfire's continuous query functionality to express my interest that way. And so that could potentially become a repository query method yeah. on a Spring Data Gemfire repository implementation. So yeah. what it returns me in that case isn't specific data, it returns me a flux. And then that flux will actually take care of handling the events that come in and I can register callbacks to that with that flux. In the reactor world, it's a flux. I think in Rx Java, I'm forgetting what the type specifically there is. Is it emitter? Yeah, there's publisher and I can't think of it off the top of my head. Anyhow, in reactive world, I'm very familiar with that since we 
springs all centered around reactor right now that would just be a flux right because it's a continuous stream of events or in the java 8 world maybe that's a better example it's a java util stream stream we actually have a streamable type in spring data Commons, so easy to confuse <laughs> those two but it's java util stream dot stream so i could return a stream and that stream could just be endless right like it could just be an endless stream of events until i cancel my subscription i'm no longer interested or whatever so it's not blocking. I'm not waiting for something to go out, execute that query on the servers and get the data back. I'm just firing, I'm just basically calling this method to express that I'm interested in receiving events when they happen. And what I get back is that flux and I can t I can treat that flux however I want, right? I can register listeners with it and I can trigger different actions when those events happen. Yeah. So you said you're kind of deliberating, should I extend the repository the repository interface itself to have this notion of a continuous query because maybe other databases in the future will want to implement the continuous, sorry, maybe other repository implementations in the future will want to implement the continuous query methodology. Is there some deliberation or are you pretty sure that you want to implement this continuous query? Well, this is, first of all, this is very specific to Spring Data Gemfire. So continuous query is a, is a terminology and a functionality that's provided by Gemfire and Geode. Okay. In our Spring Data Commons framework, we have what's called a reactive repository, or more specifically, the reactive CRUD repository. Oh, oh, okay. So like when you say, like, find by ID, it returns you a mono of that particular type because that data may not be available yet. I might have to go out and aggregate a bunch of data, and then it returns that, that data. But it doesn't block. The moment I call find by ID, it immediately returns me a mono. In Java 8 world or the Java, even the Java 5 world, it returned me something like a future, right? A Java util concurrent future. And then I can invoke that future at some point later and it blocks and it waits to get that data. In a reactive world, it's a little bit more slick than that. I can just register a callback and then I can be notified when that data is available. So it's very similar in, in concept or at least in style to kind of like what the future is. So the CQ mechanism is specifically specific to Gemfire and Geode. And I can wrap that in Spring Data Commons reactive support right our reactive repository and our reactive types like the mono and the flux so i can provide a very similar programming feel for something that's very gemfire and geode specific continuous queries for instance mongo doesn't have the notion that i know of of continuous queries for instance other stores you know provide maybe a similar functionality but they don't call it continuous queries so trying to reduce the amount of like Gemfire Geode specific terminology and put it in terms that basically users can understand by relating it to our common abstractions and in, in the core framework. Mm -hmm. I know we're up against time. I just got a couple more questions. So we, we touched on the event sourcing idea a little bit. Basically, the idea with event sourcing is changes to the overall application architecture get published to this global event stream that other subscribers can read from and change the underlying databases to respond to, for example, but the, the event stream is this single source of truth for the whole application architecture. And this is, the, the event stream is, is a data source, basically. If I'm building a Spring application and I have an event sourcing architecture, am I interfacing with the event stream through a Spring Data repository, or is there some other abstraction that I'm typically interfacing with, like a, maybe a some sort of pub sub abstraction? Or does that question make sense? It does, and the answer to that is pretty simple. It's just the flux, right? So I, I would basically trigger my interest in this events, these set of events that I'm that I've specified yeah. that I want to know about through the CQ. And then what I get back is that flux and that's all I have to interface with at that point. So the act of basically saying, okay, I want to register the CQ and be notified of events is as simple as saying, take the repository abstraction, call this method, get back the flux. And now I can use that flux from that point forward to basically receive the events and process them how I, however I choose. So at that point, it, there's, it's similar to the pub sub, right? Like I'm observing some observable thing and maybe what I get back is a future or maybe I get back an observable object of some type, right? So, or I get back a consumer or, I mean, I wouldn't get back the publisher because the publisher is the one pushing that data into and for me to consume, but I would have like some interface that I could implement 
that I could receive these events. And in this particular case, we've already got the interface, we've already got the abstractions in place with reactive types with the model and the flux. So because it's an endless stream of events, I just take that flux and I can register other things like a listener and say, well, when I receive an event, I maybe do some additional filtering within that flux and say, well, I want to take and route this event over here and I want to take event B and route it over there so I can do whatever I want with the events that come in. Going back to our temperature, you know, setting, for instance, you know, like I have high and low thresholds. I have temperatures too hot, temperatures too low. Maybe I want to do something different based on the low temperature than when it's a hot temperature. My engine's overheating, my engine's too cold, you know, or whatever the case might be. So I can do that kind of filtering at the application level because it's probably very application specific, right? I want to act on it differently depending on the event. I am interested anytime I have an event where the temperature is either too high or too low. Got it. Okay, so last question. We've been talking around this idea of reactive programming. What are the trends that, like, zooming out, what are the trends that are leading more people towards adopting reactive programming? Why was that such a focus of the the keynotes today you know we're at spring one platform there in the keynotes there was a lot of stuff about reactive programming that's a great question i think it's it's twofold from in my perspective i think it's i think it would also depend depending on who you ask so from a technical level i'll start there because at the end of the day, it all boils down to how many resources you're consuming. And the less resources you can consume to accomplish your task, obviously, the more efficient you are and the cheaper it's going to be. And if we think about things at cloud scale, it's real easy to burn through your cost at a really large scale in infrastructure like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, right? So something you have to be at least mindful of. And you want to use your resources intelligently and efficiently so you can maximize you know, your efficiency and your throughput and all that stuff. And a more, I guess, maybe fundamental level, I think it just makes sense that we, we're entering this world where, where actions are happening in real time, right? Like we want to respond to people's sentiment or their feelings or we want to be able to be responsive to our users, our customers, and we want to be able to ensure them that we're meeting their needs. And it's just, I guess in the simplest terms, it's being able to respond to change because change happens. It's continuous. It's frequent. It's always going to be there. And it's being able to act on it in real time when it matters, right? If, if somebody's unhappy with my product or my service, but I don't find out about it, you know, a couple of days later, then, you know, maybe I've already lost my customer. So I think it's being able to be more responsive and, manage things in a responsible way, which I think reactive gives us that paradigm. It gives us both the technical capabilities as well as, you know, these more semantical capabilities that are tied to the, whatever our business is about. Right. Yeah. yeah. Allows us to be more efficient and yeah. more responsive and, and all that good stuff. So, okay. John Bloom, thanks for coming to software engineering daily. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's great. Indeed Prime flips the typical model of job search and makes it easy to apply to multiple jobs and get multiple offers. Indeed Prime simplifies your job search and helps you land that ideal software engineering position from companies like Facebook or Uber or Dropbox. Candidates get immediate exposure to top companies with just one simple application to Indeed Prime. And the companies on Prime's exclusive platform message the candidates with salary and equity up front. Indeed Prime is 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now and help support Software Engineering Daily by going to indeed.com slash sedaily. That's indeed.com slash sedaily if you're looking for a job and want a simpler job search experience. You can also put money in your pocket by referring your friends and colleagues. Refer a software engineer to the platform and get $200 when they get contacted by a company and $2,000 when they accept a job through Prime. You can learn more about this at indeed.com slash prime slash referral. That's indeed.com slash prime slash referral for the Indeed referral program. Thanks to Indeed for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. If I ever leave the podcasting world and need to find a job once again, Indeed Prime will be my first stop. Wow!